Um, good morning, and uh, good evening, everyone. Um, the recording for the session has started. Um, I will be starting the session now. Uh, my name is Ria, and I'm a teacher and a research associate at Nirman. I will be moderating today's session. Uh, I want to thank everyone for being here today. I'm hoping for a few more participants to keep joining in. But uh, we start nevertheless. This is our third edition of uh, Nirman's monthly lecture series. So we aim to keep this going on a month-on-month -month basis. Uh, our previous two series are up on our YouTube channel. I will be linking them later in, at the end of the session. Uh, today's lecture series, the this month's lecture series is called Teachers, Teaching, and Training. So we are um, going to talk about two main subjects and the teaching and how teachers go about the pedagogy of it. Uh, today's lecture is the teaching of social studies, history and social studies. Uh, I have been a teacher at Nirman for the last year and a half, and uh, these are the exact two subjects that I've been teaching. I've been teaching social studies and English, so uh, this is a pretty interesting series for me. And then we were discussing about brainstorming on ideas of what should we begin. Uh, I think I jumped on these because uh, it would have been a very interesting topic for me, and I know so many other teachers and teacher educators out there who keep questioning what is it, how is it that social studies ought to be taught, how is it that English ought to be taught in such a multilingual country. And uh, that is why I think it's a very important topic, so personally for me as well as a lot of teachers that I'm not speaking to as well. Today's session is the, his the teaching of history and social studies. So history in particular and social studies in general uh, they tend, they tend to be a boring subject or they're called very unpopular in secondary school. So what is it that, what, what is the approach that one ought to take? What are few of the approaches rather that one ought to take uh, when we are discussing about the pedagogy of these subjects is something that uh, Nita Ma'am will be talking about today. So before I hand it over to her, I would like to speak a little bit about her and about the organization Nirman. Uh, Nirman is a not-for-profit organization based out of Varanasi district in India. We work in the Varanasi city and we work in 12 adjoining villages uh, in the Varanasi district. Nirman was started in 1990, so this is our 30th year of working in the fields of education, art, research. We run an innovative school, the school that I teach in that I just spoke about. It's called the Vidyashram, the South Point School. So we have two campuses, one in the city, one in the, in the beautiful riverside village of Bhutan. It's an integrated school where students from diverse backgrounds uh, are present in all of our classrooms. So students from families of farmers, weavers, daily wage workers, entrepreneurs, researchers, and more. They're all part of the school together. Uh, so one of the ethos of our school is inclusivity. Um, we also run a research wing called the Center of Postcolonial Education. So uh, this is where we research. This is where you know lecture series like this takes place. We also host study abroad students from universities around the world and invite collaboration from educators and artists in different fields. Uh, so we also have an art studio. So through our art studio, we collaborate with artists from various backgrounds of music, visual art, theater, martial arts. Uh, our school calendars uh, were usually filled uh, before COVID-19 uh, with all of these projects throughout the year. Uh, there was not a single month when we did not have like an interesting artist collaborative project going on. Uh, with the current setup of COVID, uh, with the current uh, COVID-19 crisis, a lot of our work has been affected, and we're trying to find new ways to keep engaging and new ways to keep researching and continuing the dialogue on education. Uh, this is one such effort, and your participation is really important for this. Thank you so much, personally, for coming here. Um, now, I would like to introduce uh, Nita Ma'am, as she's known to all of us over here. Uh, she completed her PhD from the University of Chicago. Her fields of research have been in the history of modern India, anthropology, as well as Russian and European history. She has taught at the University of Chicago, Brown University, and University of Michigan, amongst other places. And mainly, she's the founder and director of Nirman. For the past 30 years, she has taught, written curricula, trained teachers, and worked on children's books and art at Nirman. So, uh, one thing that I have personally learned from her is that how to integrate so many subjects together. And that is going to be one of the points 
in today's talk as well that how social studies or history or geography or political science is not just single units or single textbooks. They are kind of embedded together in a curricula, in a classroom, with the teachers and with the students. It's something that happens inside the classroom and it's all uh, kind of integrated. Uh, so yeah, she has written multiple books and research papers, presented her research at numerous places. Uh, she takes university. She recently retired as the South, uh, South Asian History Chair. Uh, she used to take courses on uh, South Asian history, gender, Bollywood. Over the years, uh, she has trained a lot of teachers, uh, not just at Myanmar, but different BS colleges, different study abroad programs. Students from uh, Miranda House, Lady Sri Ram College in, in India, a lot of lot of abroad international groups as well. Like there was some class, University of Washington, Columbia University, and many, many more. So it's still kind of long. So I'm gonna um, stop speaking here, and I would now now like to invite uh, Nita Ma'am to introduce and start today's lecture on the teaching of history and uh, social studies. We will have a question and answer round at the end of the session in the last 15 minutes. So please feel free to drop your questions in the chat box as and when they come. Back. Uh, thank you very much, Ria. Please confirm that I'm audible and visible. <laughs> yes, you are audible. Thank you. And visible. Um, and thank you to all the participants in this webinar. It's come a time when you can truly say there are so many meetings going on and so many calls to webinars that it's a privilege to have you all here because there's a lot of competition with interesting topics. Um, there are many, many things to say on the, on the subject of the difficulties of history teaching in India. And uh, I'm going to come to try to touch on all of them. But I want to first emphasize and spend the brunt of the time of my lecture in talking about how precisely to make this particular subject, history slash social studies, um, likable and popular and therefore successful in schools. So let's look at it as if it's a puzzle and try to put together the pieces of it. Let's take the case of a hypothetical student, call, call her Nidhi. She is 12, and that means she's in class six when the serious history teaching begins in Indian schools. And let's the take the case of a boy, Aslam, who is in class eight. So they're both doing different periods of Indian history. Nidhi, let's say, is the daughter of a shopkeeper, maybe of fabric. And uh, Aslam is the son of a mechanic. So now we have um, a sort of rough set of dimensions for two students that we are trying to solve the problem as to how they can possibly get excited or at least interested in the subject called history. I'll come to other social studies. Now, in order to like any subject, they have to uh, try to make some connections between that subject and their own lives. I think that's a given. And I know that most of you are educators and you have probably heard this many times in many versions and have thought about it and talked about it yourselves. How can the teaching of history with its amazing span in India of, at a rough estimate, 5,000 years, be possibly made relevant or of any direct um, connection to children's lives, like Nidhi and Aslam. It's a tall order. And we all have these familiar exercises that we begin with, such as making family trees or uh, digging up in the sand or mud to see how archaeologists work and seeing, trying to interpret what we come up with. Fine, these are good exercises, but then what? We have a lot of events, personalities, and processes to still try to link to children's lives. So let's look at the question of what possibly interests the little girl Nidhi, 12 years old, daughter of a merchant. She um, is interested in the following things, I'd say, how to get more freedom from her parents to go out and spend time with her friends, how to keep her body in shape now that it is undergoing certain changes, 
uh, how to get her parents to provide her with nice attractive clothes and other things that she sees on ads she sees in shops she sees other people wearing um how to prove to her classmates that she is actually very smart that means smart in the intellectual sense that she is a sharp person and then how to sort out for herself what are possible dreams that she could nurture and how they could possibly be realized and if you ask me and we don't need to look at aslam separately because i think these are exactly the issues that interest aslam as well all the same things so children's lives in other words are all about sweat and toil love and attachment fantasy and terror transgression and punishment boring routines of home and school some rather uninteresting and even stupid people with power over them that's the adults some peers that they can trust and some they can't and then smaller people their juniors who they can either bully or protect if you put it like that you understand that in fact every child's life is like an illustrated history of something or the other it's like a chapter in the history of the world or of any particular part of the world in other words you have to first articulate and interpret the child's life story for what it actually is under the seeming mundane appearance of the surface and then you can establish the link between it and the history that you want to teach as scholars of fairy tales and folk tales particularly have elaborated the appeal of these often very fantastical and extremely violent and dramatic stories lies in that they reach uh, the core of what a child is actually worrying about in terms of conflict and possible violence in their own uh, and their vulnerability in their own lives and spaces they feel children do feel that the world is hostile but in a very uh, intangible way they do feel that power is everywhere they do feel that there is conflict and some kind of threat around the corner they want security they want kindness they want love but they also want a magic that is often very elusive and so they like fairy tales now what i am suggesting is that if history is a story of very different times very different uh, particular episodes and people and structures it's not that different to fairy tales what i'm suggesting is that it could be made of personal appeal to children because we realize that once we have uh, spelt out what a child is and their emotions relationships and worries then we will be able to make some connections between things that seem ostensibly very different but are actually very very comparable so we have to as in actually all humanist disciplines first start with having the children think about themselves and for us to help them articulate this thinking and all the humanity subjects need to do that and they should get integrated at some point in time so that they can support each other and make this happen for the children now let's move on to some things concrete as to what we are going to do we are going to teach nidhi who is in class 6 let's say about the maurya dynasty and we are going to teach aslam who is in class 8 about the coming of the east india company to bengal and for those of you who are history buffs you know that we couldn't have chosen two more fascinating topics in indian history and now you see that what you need to do is two things simultaneously you need to make sure that the identities of these children let me recapitulate so nidhi is a middle class child she is an intelligent person an independent person a proud person a jealous person a yearning person a quester and so is aslam just slightly older so these dimensions of human beings are things that have arisen out of certain social situations so the two things you have to do is to somehow show simultaneously to the children that societies are very similar that people are the within the uh, nesting 
and the networking of various processes. And therefore, there are very important differences in their responses. But those basic uh, feelings, emotions, worries, issues, turmoils, relationships are actually very, very comparable. And at the same time, you have to show that there are different times which are so different to ours that it's mind boggling. It's beyond the imagination. It seriously has to be sit down, pondered over, and hopefully discussed with each other. So in Nidhi's case, for example, I mean, they're, they're, she's going to study about a society where there are actually kings and emperors and spies and soldiers and priests and courtesans. We live in almost an opposite kind of society. And the way to bring this home is uh, partly by talking directly about the present. So I would say uh, we should invite someone, maybe someone with uh, an office in today's um, state or society, who can talk directly about what our laws and our rights are. And if we can't, we can, the teacher herself can take the help of the Constitution of India. That's absolutely the best document to always rely on and to show what, in fact, our rights and responsibilities are. So that's a document about today's society. And then she can introduce Kautilya's Arthashastra, which is a kind of constitution of the modern period. So the teacher can explain at this point how we actually know what we know uh, because of this document. And she can compare the two documents because in both cases, they are idealizations of actuality. They are what people have written down as desirable, as what they wish should happen. In one case, it's a manual for the training of the leaders. In the other case, it's a statement of what the leaders think the country should uh, head towards. So um, the, the Arthashastra will then give insights, excerpts from it can be used judiciously, uh, and that's what's called a primary document. So it will give insights into relationships and uh, structures, both of domination and of freedom, work patterns, jobs, trade, commerce, laws, uh, all kinds of infrastructural things. And it will give us very um, teasing insights and therefore questions into what the lives of ordinary people must have been like at that time. So the trick is for the teacher to do both things simultaneously. And that's, you know, going back to one thing which I've discussed earlier and elsewhere, which is about the curriculum. We have to be very self-conscious and deliberate about the curriculum we are teaching. And when we make these connections to ourselves, we are teaching what I call a post-colonial style of uh, curricular planning. And when we teach what was going on at that time and use primary documents, moreover, then we are within the realm of the classical curriculum. And both are extremely important and both have to be balanced. And the teacher has to be clever enough not to get caught up in any kind of um, mistake about the, the myth of progress, that we are now so advanced that we don't have caste and we don't have uh, prostitution and we don't have spying and militancy and so on. She has to be able to uh, talk critically as well as with adulation about both periods. Now, there are some very interesting and um, stimulating, challenging questions that will arise in this example of mine of the modern period. One would, be, one would be, if you were to make a comparison, do we have a state religion today? And uh, you might think, well, children of class six, they may not have much of an opinion, they may not know what it means and what uh, its implications are. But recently in the online classes of our own school, I had occasion to witness that uh, actually children, especially in this lockdown period, are so exposed to the media and to the adults' conversations at home and to all kinds of discussions which they otherwise may have been on the periphery of, that they have willy-nilly adopted quite um, strong opinions on many subjects. So there may be uh, students who will claim, yes, we do have a state religion. Of course we do. It's the majority religion. And that's where it's up to the teacher of history and social studies to point out 
that these things are, need a longer time span to be decided. And many judgments in history are only passed in retrospect. So a particular party, even if it's the ruling party, a particular party's policies or program or preferred state of affairs does not change what is the nature of our constitutionally uh, and legally accepted society. So in fact, we are uh, a nation very proud of our diversity and our secularism, and that has to be emphasized in the class. In the modern period, on the other hand, the biggest of the emperors of the dynasty, Ashoka, uh, not only became a Buddhist, but he uh, wanted the whole empire to follow in his footsteps, and he put forward Buddhism as the state religion. And this is a very interesting story in itself, both the fact of the strength and then um, popularity of Buddhism in winning over many rulers, but also the evidence for this, which is where all the wonderful fact of evidence gathering comes in through, in this case, stupas and edicts and inscriptions. Now, on the matter of a state religion and the role of the leaders, whether it's a ruling party or whether it's a king or emperor, in deciding what the religion of the people should be, the official religion. After that, could, uh, uh, one could throw out the question to the children themselves, what kind of evidence do you think you'd need to have in order to, uh, in order to decide whether, uh, how the people took this? So we know the emperor's side because he left us all those inscriptions and he built really fancy uh, pillars and buildings and we know what he wanted. You know, he says as much, I, your father, etc. cetera. Um, but what did the people want? And so what kind of evidence would be need for that? And that would then allow them to develop much more critical thinking about themselves in today's time and happenings. So uh, we would then be able to linger on all those wonderful things of the past, such as empires and battles, religious leaders like the Buddha, their popularity, their spread, their reach, uh, the fact of Ashoka's own life and career, and so on. And this, uh, the teacher can very skillfully uh, weave in things to show how they are different and, and similar to today. Let's move on to the really important question. Why do teachers not always do all this? Why do they not personalize their topics? And why do they not make it of so um, profound, such profound interest to children that the children don't have to be coerced into learning, but they are ready to discover more and more about whatever the period is that's being taught. Why don't the teachers do that? And the first answer, of course, is that it's much more difficult to do than to teach straight from the book. Now, the NCRT books are wonderful. And I always think with great pleasure of all my friends and colleagues who have been the authors and advisors on these books. I can see how hard they worked and how well they uh, tried to balance all the different aspects of a good history book. But the truth is that history cannot really be taught successfully from a book. The teacher has to have the facts in hand. She can use notes if she likes, any kind of notes, it doesn't matter. But she has to be comfortable enough with the main story to be able to extemporize depending on what's happening in her classroom at, at that moment in time. Um, she has to think very specifically about the children and what their minds may be on. Remember, we are talking about classroom teaching and the very materials within that are the children themselves. The raw materials are the children. In any kind of production, in any kind of process, if you're not totally intimately familiar with the raw materials, you're not going to get very far. So we have to really understand where the children's minds are. And we have to take it very seriously. It's not a joke. It's not a, it's not a playful thing I'm saying of how to make the story that we are so familiar with come to life 
by relating it to the children's lives. Now, it's good to talk about ordinary common people when we do that, because that's what all of us are. But even if we are not nawabs and badshahs and sultans and kings and emperors, it's completely fine to talk about these great people. Children's stories very often have leaders of different kinds and people who are actually different to the common person. And they have no problem with it. And I think that's because all children have a germ of that same kind of leadership and greatness inside them. Then it gets, you know, sort of smoothed away and ironed away with um, all kinds of things that happen to them as they grow up. But um, the teacher has to then think very imaginatively from the point of view of the child, but also as an adult teacher, she has to think deliberately, pedagogically, in a narrative way and a discursive way. <clears throat> By narrative, I mean that she has to uh, put a lot of um, belief and faith in the virtue of a story well told. She has to really think about storytelling as a whole pedagogic approach. Every single thing in history is a story in itself. And if it's not talked about like that, we are missing a huge, rich resource as to how to use, uh, teach that subject. And by discursive, I mean that she has to go beneath the surface and make connections which are not at all evident on the surface, such as between, say, a village woman going to fill her pot at the pond and the large taxation system of the economy or any such kind of connection, which seems elusive. But once you work at it, the good news is that it gets easier when you get the hang of it. It gets easier and more and more interesting. So the second point is that the reason why, the second explanation for why teachers don't do this as a rule is because most of us, I definitely can speak for myself, have grown up in a system with rote learning and memorization. And if we did well, but even if we didn't, the psychological uh, trick that we play on ourselves is to think that if it was good enough for us, it's going to be good enough for the children. And I had to mug up so much. Why can't they do it too? And you know that we all, between ourselves, old classmates and groups of us, we love to tell anecdotes about that certain teacher who would keep us standing in class if he could not repeat word by word of whatever she had set us to learn. So those are our favorite anecdotes. We don't really, we haven't gotten over uh, the fact that instead of joking about these things, joking is fine, you know, I'm not saying don't joke, but we have to take it seriously that actually it was a problem that we went through that kind of schooling. And we also know the answer. We know that the world has changed from our own childhood and our own school days. We know that <laughs> children's attention spans is dangerously curtailed. We know how powerful the media is, the screen, the internet, the phone, and all that. We have huge competition out there. We all take pride in our professionalism. We take pride in um, being able to battle age and senility. So here is our chance. We are going to have to fight these terrible things that are happening. And it's, it's not only necessary, but we can make it very pleasurable. I can guarantee you that our lives as teachers will be much happier if we adopt these other ways that I'm suggesting rather than relying on the book and memorization. But the third and possibly the biggest unsurmountable seemingly obstacle is the whole big course that has to be completed. Every history teacher I've met, met and talked to complains about the size of the syllabus and the few number of classes that they get in a week and then the short span of those classes. And then to that, they add further problems like the size of the students, uh, student body in their classroom. Now, as you might know, I run a private school. So I can't uh, address these problems of how to change the class size and how to change the timetable for other people. They are all going to have to decide this. But I have some um, proposals that can appeal to many people across the board. So the first thing is that um, you have to divide the class into groups, no matter what the size of the total class is. 
and you have to give different work to each group so that they, when they come together as a class, each group can present to the whole body whatever they have done intensively. It's not possible to cover the course for everyone at the same intense level, but they can be peer learning by doing this kind of thing. Then secondly, you have to introduce the idea of drill work. Now, drill work is very specifically things like datelines, chronologies, dynasties, uh, sort of, you know, what you do in English, name, place, person, thing kind of charts. They have to know certain names and they cannot get confused between the names of a text and the names of people and the names of places. Now, the good thing is that children actually have terrific memories, even up to class six, seven, eight, and they actually love to memorize. So as long, <clears throat> as long as it's not the only thing they're made to do, as long as they're first made, uh, being made interested in that work, in that subject, then you can also give them this drill work. And to add to that, you can do a lot of nice questions and answers, but always by playing around with it. So the questions should be self-evident. They should be what are called the what, why, when, where questions which they can also phrase if asked to. And they should be able to rephrase that question in another way. That's one of the exercises that's very elementary but important to do. And similarly, the answer has to be something that you can turn around and put in other words so that they don't freeze up inside and imagine that there is some innate truth to a certain string of words, either put as a question or put as an answer. So this might seem like an English exercise more than a social studies one. And yes, there should be a lot of uh, overlap between the work in an ideal situation, between the work being done by the English and the social studies teacher. But actually, it's about the concept of the thing. It's about understanding the topic. It's really not about the language. By playing around with the language, you are freeing them from the language and you're making them realize the, the meaning of what those words say so that they can themselves rephrase the question and rephrase the answer and be totally comfortable with discussing it in different ways. Um, let me then just uh, come to something else and it may have been on many of your minds. What are other problems apart from these strictly pedagogical ones in history teaching in India? Now, you might know that professional historians are going through um, a lot of worrying about two major problems, one older than the other. The older one is that for some time now, all historians, professional historians who consider themselves good, state of the art, um, dedicated to their craft, have been worrying about the fact that most of the history taught in schools, it's what it's what is what's called nationalist history, the history of nation states. And it's not reflexive. It doesn't question whether the idea of a France, a Germany, an England, an India can be questioned. It just talks about a history of India or a history of this, a history of that. So this nationalist history is also sometimes called uh, a grand narrative version of history. And that is really under attack by professional historians who would prefer much more reflexivity, much more questioning, much more delving into the local community-based and um, hidden histories of, say, women and tribals and peasants and working class people, not merely of states and the people who govern the states and the policies they made with regard to the governing of the states. That's one problem. Um, and for now, I'm going to just say that that's a professional historian's problem and the solution is going to lie with professional historians. Why what they do does not trickle down to the school level is another question to answer. And it is a slightly different question. But the second problem that professional historians are very preoccupied with is a more recent one. And it's this. History as a discipline has been targeted presently as one of the main disciplines which can be uh, free for everyone to have a voice in so that everyone can be an amateur historian and speak with equal confidence and a loud vocal status 
about what they think the history of the past has been in India. Um, what they mostly say is very extreme, and sometimes it's extremely abusive as well, because they label certain kinds of historians by epithets such as secular or liberal, uh, often leftist, often Marxist, none of which can bear scrutiny. Um, and these people write in certain sites very prolifically, and they keep on and on mostly narrating the grandeurs of the past, as I said, sometimes in very extreme ways, more or less always in ways that are not substantiated by any kinds of the usual uh, ways in which historians work through the use of evidence. Um, the problem with this kind of uh, position is that for history writing, one elementary thing that has to be understood, and therefore for teachers, it's a, a thing that has to be taught to students, is that history is by definition a matter of debate and controversy. There is such a thing as historiography, which is the way of writing history. And historiography is as crucial to learn as history. It just simply means that never take a fact for granted because someone else will come along with more evidence or with a different interpretation about that very same fact. So good history is the very opposite of this kind of popular history that's now making uh, itself very uh, visible and vocal on the internet. Good history is by definition something open-ended, something which can be contested and it needs proof and evidence and therefore it's never a closed chapter. And supposing there is no consensus, then the very search for evidence is enough of a good history. You don't have to have a consensus. You can leave it open in a very good history book or chapter. You can say, this is not known, or you can say, this is not agreed upon. You do not have to use history as a tool or a weapon to fight for the greatness of your state or your community or your nation. That's not what history is. It's a way of thinking smartly, of piecing together evidence, of making diagnoses and deductions, and then coming up with the best possible interpretation and leaving it open at that. Now, some of these, uh, the people who write in this militant and abusive vein, they sound so much like each other that I don't even think it's about history writing. I don't even think they care about history as such. I think there's some kind of a workshop somewhere where all these answers are routinely churned out and then they're given to all kinds of people to put online under different names. That's what I think. Uh, and the motivation here is merely to increase the support for whichever party is funding it. I don't think that it has much to do with history, whether the reality of it or the distortion of it. I know that professional historians, myself included, get very upset. But what we must do is not get derailed from our actual business of trying to make, do our own work, of course, as historians, but trying to make history really a matter of, of inquiry and substantiation for our students. One thing that we are very fond of at Nirman, and it is my personal uh, special love that I've nurtured over the years, is the idea of having providing more and more stories, historical fiction for children. We already have such a large repertoire of research on Indian history. It, it's my dream that many, much of it, could be presented, represented at different levels for children in a slightly fictionalized way so as to grab their attention. It, it's not at all undoable. It just needs the right, you know, making of the project. And uh, as you might know, it's been done in other countries for other kinds of societies. You're all familiar with those stories where uh, a boy and a girl or a group of friends happen to find whatever, a magic pebble or a wishing tree or a time machine or something. And they're able to get uh, answers to what other parts of what other times were like, right? And, and they are both, um, you know, uh, fascinated at what they discover, which they didn't know, but very happy to have confirmed what they did want to know and they had been learning all the time anyway. So anyway, to conclude, here are the steps. 
for some wonderful history teaching. First, put the book aside. Put the book aside, start with a story. Make the story one of conflict. This is what children find interesting and what they quite rightly understand the world to be about. This will itself build an emotional bond between your student and whatever topic it is that you're teaching. Then uh, ask them to put questions, make their own questions about it. And you know, that same familiar question which we ask is a good one. What have you done or experienced that is similar to this thing that we are reading about? And it doesn't matter if what you're reading about is a Mughal emperor or a big religious leader or a bhakti saint or whatever, there will be enough in common in everyone's experience. Um, so this then can move on to what I've called the what, when, how, where questions, where the students have to phrase their own questions and have two, three versions of them and then put their answers also in different versions. And they can put this to each other, more of peer learning. The third step would be to keep up the drill work so that they have some very specific core bit of knowledge and they are going to be proud of that. They're going to really want to do well in any test that you set them. All this while you keep up the project and the research work. The research is particularly important and here you might have to play a trick. So you can make a you can get known to them the, the usual forms of evidence, whether on online research, through newspapers, through artifacts, etc. But you can also present a topic to do research on and then teach them how to make up the evidence. This way they get to think about what is evidence and how it is to be used. So for example, if your topic is, how did, um, how did a British officer relate to a farmer in the 19th century, to an ordinary Indian farmer in the 19th century. Personally, you can also teach them how to reframe it as a statement, which becomes a hypothesis. So here the hypothesis could be, the British officer did not treat the Indian farmer well in the 19th century. What kind of evidence would you need? And they can make up all of it. They can make up a government report or a document about the farmers in a particular place. They can find a song or make up a song sung by those people there about the cruelty of officers. They can find a newspaper report about a little minor revolt or protest somewhere. Yeah. Uh, they can find images of an officer riding by paying no attention to the farmers around and so on. You get the idea. They have to be sucked in into um, what actually children's minds long for some kind of detective work, some kinds of piecing together a puzzle, some kind of investigation under the lens. Tell them they are all going to be Sherlock Holmeses and they'll be as happy as pie. Okay? I think a final question that deserves to be answered, asked and answered, is, um, okay, so Nita ma'am, you're giving us all these great ideas about how to teach history, but actually in, um, in, in expensive private schools, in elite schools, in so-called good schools, the, the, the students do very well in the history exams. They actually get good marks and then they go on to uh, do good things with those marks. So aren't you going to call that good history teaching? All right, so here we have to make sure that we know the criterion for what is good history teaching. There are two criteria. There is one that you can keep a very good notebook well covered with margins and questions and answers written and you learn up that and you learn up your notes and your textbook things and so on and you do well in your written exams and you get high marks definitely that's one criterion of success and then what happens all that work is probably lost you forget it all no connection has been made to your life you have not understood what is the basic of the discipline of history which is about inquiry and investigation you just think it's about facts and well, I learned of the facts and I did well. And may I say that in the long run, since you did not make that connection with your own life and others' lives, there is a loss altogether to us as a nation because those who are the products of such elite schools are exactly those who come, get to be the leaders in everything in society 
and they are out of touch with the things that are happening in our world of India because the history they learned was so boring and factual. So um, the second criterion would be what I described, that people actually get interested and they start understanding the power and beauty and challenge of history. Of course, you can't complete your course. Let me say at the outset that you should put that aside. You should do selective work. No one can complete our present CBSC class 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 books. They cannot if they are going to do at all a good job. But even the exams have choices. And there are other ways to do some things on the side without having to plow through them all equally. Let me be clear at the very end. I am not saying to throw over facts or what's called the grand narrative of history or nationalist history. It's very, very important to know that it's the classical curriculum and it's not going to be only rich children in rich schools who are going to have access to it and therefore succeed in everything. It's very empowering. That kind of factual history is a what's called a cynic decay. It's a, it's a shortcut, a short abbreviation for good education. And we must share that power with all children. Let them know the facts. They must know basic outlines of things. But first, let them get interested in the subject. So that next time around when you meet, if I ask you, do you have students who love history? And instead of us saying, oh my goodness, very few, we are all going to be able to say yes. My students love history. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for the talk. Um, before we have one question already, but before that, there was one such, uh, question posed by someone in the um, sign up sheet that would be very relevant uh, at this point. So the question goes something like uh, the teaching of social studies would include and would have a very important criterion of teaching history without any bias. Uh, how can a teacher go about doing something like that, especially when textbooks themselves are written in a biased manner? And we have heard news about how selective histories have been, you know, curated out. So how does one, as a teacher, how should one approach something like this? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, I know that bias sounds like a terrible thing. Uh, but you can put bias in quotation marks because for historians, it's not that, that there is bias versus objectivity. You know, it's not a science like that. History is interpretation. Every historian has their own bias. And professional historians do not regard that as a problem. If you read the preface or the beginning of a history book, the historian will say, this is why I chose this topic. This is why I love it. This is what I thought about it. This is what I went out to do. So they've already come with some kind of a mindset. Apart from that, there's their, there is their training. If you are trained anywhere in a good university or college, you're going to be biased in the ways of that college or university, that school of thought, the body of teachers who work with you. It's unavoidable. So the point is not how to avoid bias. The point is how to face it, make it very explicit, spell it out, discuss it, and do creative things with it. So at the school level, you must make sure that your children understand what kinds of biases there could be, where they could come from, and to always ask about that, always ask questions. The problem that, that happens with lay people when they write about history just as I was describing earlier, especially on the internet, they assume so much confidence. They just say, I will tell you the facts now. Everyone else was biased so far. That's so idiotic. I mean, someone else is going to say that about them. And someone else, it goes on and on and on. That's not, that's not good history, writing or teaching or thinking about it. So this bias thing, don't even, let's talk about it. Put it in quotation marks and talk only about how to understand it and then how to learn to uh, read it when it comes across and to do things with it which are constructive, such as 
there could be a Marxist history and there could be a liberal history and there could be a feminist history, all of the same topic. Well, it's very nice to compare them and each one will have something to tell us. All right. Thank you. Uh, so there's a, it's a very long question. I think it has more than two or three questions in it by Garima. So I'll just read out what she has posted. Uh, history, I feel, has a lot of conflicts and is full of opportunities of learning to deal with conflict. But the current approach to it has been reduced to facts and information. What kind of pedagogical approach are pre-service teachers, so teacher, people who are learning to be teachers, uh, should be educated in, in a way that they can make fact learning easy? That was, I think, the first part of the question. The second part is that uh, uh, how can one go about having an open, uh, open conversations about the peaceful and non-violent feels for children in a, in a way that they can also deal with conflict and they can build their historical understanding. So uh, how I have understood the question is that um, how you said that, you know, children would learn from fantasy, children would learn from fiction and the ideas of conflict in the, sto in the story is kind of let them reel back to their personal experiences as well. So maybe if you can talk a little bit more about that, maybe give more examples about how can that be used in schools. So maybe these two questions to begin. Yeah, yeah, sure. So uh, yeah, uh, again, I. Um, Hello. I yeah yeah. Sorry. Yeah, this is Pratyay. Uh, is that no, no, I'm Pratyay. Uh, so I had a similar kind of question. So I thought I'll just add on to that uh, before Ma'am starts speaking. So, uh, so yeah, I, this is Pratyay. So I'm working uh, with Teach for India right now. And uh, like I'm also working with a group of educators uh, from Northeast. Uh, so as their teacher educator right now. So uh, I was just like curious of uh, the question that Garima has also asked. So do you think like, uh, you know, because different region of the country has different kinds of uh, regional history, right? Uh, a history of conflicts or like the shared shared history of their culture or identity, right? So, uh, like I you know, as as a educa teacher educator who is not from that area, uh, when I'm going to step uh, into work with them, do you think there is a specific uh, pedagogical approach that uh, we should follow uh, to teach history in that particular region? of a country like does that really uh, matter so i just wanted to have some clarity thank you so ma'am you can take these questions and i'll post the next questions later okay so um i um coming back to garimas i actually evaluate conflict very highly if you remember i was even saying always start with a story and emphasize the conflict in the story because uh, it's right there. There's no point beating about the bush. It's all about good versus evil or dark versus light or kindness versus cruelty and power versus powerlessness. It's there in every single story of history and all around us in everyday life. Uh, and your middle school and high school children are aware of it. And actually, so are younger children. But we don't need to get into that right now. So uh, what the job of history here is, is to give intellectual tools and interpretive tools. And for that, it's very important to be comparative. If you just look at one region, one segment of history, one, one particular topic in history and one period of time, then it's very difficult to interpret it holistically. But if you can make a comparison with a similar thing elsewhere, you'll firstly find that conflicts are uh, very, very um, similar all over the place. It's about who did what to whom, when, why, where, and then what happened. And bring, to, bring home this fact that unless you can interpret all these dimensions of the conflict well, you're never being, uh, going to be able to resolve it. So the resolution itself falls into another territory, but becoming intellectually competent to address it as a question, you know, how did it happen and what does it mean? 
is within the realm of history. And so it, it's a matter of intellectual rigor. It's, there's, there's, you know, um, a fine line to draw between emotion and intellect. So I'm not saying that your emotions have to be kept out of it. The very reason why you are talking about conflict at all is because you are so invested in it. You don't have to be from the Northeast. Anywhere in India, there is a conflict. And if you can't see it, if you can't acknowledge it, then it's the job of the teacher to bring it out and the job of the trainer teachers, which is what you were asking about. I, I, I think that any course of history and any course of training for teaching of history should actually have that in the title. My own course, <laughs> which I teach of the history of India is called Conflicts and Controversies in India. Because conflicts means all the things that happen if it's not between uh, rich and poor, or those who are taxed and those who are taxing, then it's about uh, some other group of people, you know, two rival kings and their, their citizen bodies. Uh, then there is the gender conflict, then there's uh, communal conflict, you know, the list goes on. And controversies means the different ways of interpreting these, so historiographical controversies. So between one and the other, there is nothing which is smooth and completely fine and uh, without a problem in history. And problems are fun, intellectually speaking, not for those who are living them out, but for those who are studying them. And that has to be the goal of the teacher, to make them intellectually compelling and striking and challenging. Thank you. Um, so one last thing by Garima, uh, what she wanted to ask was that um, schools and teachers have certain systems in place and teachers are binded by it so how free are teachers or how can they navigate through the system political managerial systems to implement a pedagogy that allows uh, historical thinking to be built in children uh, that was one question the second question is by simrita uh, see she asks that you know you have been speaking about historical fiction and there are a lot of interesting indian, uh, indian literature books on that uh, and if children have been exposed to the whole realm of critical literacy, they may be able to understand fact from fiction. But do you particularly have any suggestions about how to approach uh, using historical fiction in a classroom? And do you, do you want me to add one more question? Yeah, sure, yeah. So a very simple one, um, I think it's a small one, but I don't think it's very simple. So um, is it always required for a child to be Proud of one's history. Sorry, proud of? Is it always required for a child yeah. to be proud of one's history, one's national history, local history, maybe? I mean, they've not specified it, but just having pride in one's history. Yeah. Um, Ria, do you mind just repeating the very first one of these three? Uh, yeah. So, uh, how free are teachers? How free are teachers? I got oh, it. I remember now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, the thing about fiction was uh, how to use fiction in history. Yeah, in our approach, if you have any specific approach. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So about um, how to um, maneuver around some controls. Now, actually, uh, no, I, I, I think it's fair to say that no administrator uh, of a school would um, control excellence, right? If you can good, good, get good results then there should be no problem with your teaching. Uh, it could be that your class becomes a little noisy because you have a lot of discussion or the children seem to be doing a lot of projects and more than is warranted or they seem to be enjoying themselves so much. Why are they not looking more dull and bored? Something like that. But, you know, in, in the kind of history teaching that I am putting forward, the whole point is to get them so interested that you can still do your regular course work. I'm not saying to have a parallel kind of teaching. And if it's, if it's the same um, syllabus, but just being taught in a much more imaginative, personalized way, then um, I know you could have initial problems with your management, but if you can show the results, if you can ask them to give you enough time to show the results over a semester, two semesters, or a year, then that's your challenge. You're going to have to show the results. The children should all be happier. They should be all more 
interested in the subjects, they should all be getting better marks, they should all be talking more intelligently, they should be able to take part in debates, discussions, all kinds of things, much more than before. You know, uh, some managements are very retrograde and they might not like anything if you sing a song in class or teach a song because you think that's part of your history topic. They might object to that. So you might have to take the help of some of your peers because that's a very specific question to certain kinds of schools. And I have seen schools like that. I know principals like that. Um, how do I use fiction? I use fiction um, in a way that I uh, sort of reverse it. In other words, to me, the fact itself is actually a fiction. And I don't have to go searching for fiction. As soon as I start talking about coming back to my Moria uh, example, I start talking about Cotillia or uh, Ashoka. They really seem like, uh, like figures of fiction to me. Uh, what else is a, a fiction figure? It's some, someone that you know a little bit about, whatever you've been told, but usually your imagination creates the rest. You imagine what that person must look like, walk like, talk like, dress like, etc. That's what I want to do in history. I want, when I, I remember teaching in class six uh, and seven and eight, I've taught all those classes, but I used to want to make children draw, say, um, Ali Wardi Khan, Nawab of Bengal, what kind of shoes must he have had, what must he have, have, he have eaten for breakfast, by little uh, tricks like that. Uh, and we don't know the answers, at least we don't have the time to get into the uh, heavy duty research to get the answers. But any answer is fine because it doesn't really matter. The point is to think about it and to personalize that character and make it seem uh, as if it's on a plane with us. So we have those preoccupations with shoes and clothes and breakfast, and so must he have had. And if he can once start thinking about the character like that, then we are safe, meaning now we are going to be able to study this history without getting bored out of our wits and wanting to shunt it away for something that we think is more fun, such as reading a work of fiction. Well, I want to make the very factual uh, episodes of history just like works of fiction. I don't need to bring in extra fiction. Having said that, I must uh, uh, repeat what I said earlier also, that in India, we really lack enough actual historical fiction for children. So when they are studying about any period, what a pleasure it would be if we history teachers could also hand out half a dozen books and say, read all these. And they <laughs> supplement what they are studying, but they are all, all over the place because the authors have deliberately made them like that. And they're very interesting and fun, but they're all fiction, deliberately fiction. So that, that's a different kind of fiction. What I've said, that fiction doesn't exist yet. So I'm not saying that we can actually start using it very deliberately. Very few spotty kinds of historical fiction exist in India. As far as I know, there's exactly one book or two on the Mauryas. I mean, a work of fiction. But um, hopefully much more will come about and be produced soon. But meanwhile, what we can do is use the tactics and the strategies and the uh, lovely uh, aspects of fiction and make our historical periods and topics come alive in those ways. The last, the third question was, is it important to be proud of one's history? Yeah. Um, I think it is, but it is very important to make children more intelligent about one's history. The pride in one's history doesn't have to transgress on the intelligence and to make us stupid instead of being intelligence, intelligent. So uh, nationalism is a tricky thing. All of us might feel very nationalistic and love our country, be proud of many, many things and be ready to fight for it, defend it, etc. cetera. Um, but you cannot do it at the expense of intelligence. You have to remember that every time you say we are great as a nation and we have done this, that or the other, you are saying something which you have artificially bounded because we are talking about ourselves, we are saying it and it's correct. But if you were to go outside those boundaries, other people have equal claims 
to greatness and splendor and glory in their own histories. And there is no reason on earth to think we are better or greater than anyone, which doesn't mean that we can't love ourselves and our past and be very, very, very proud of it. A small example comes to mind. Recently, we had Hindi Divas, and I'm a Hindi uh, lover, so I'm always trying to promote it in every way possible and use it and love it and read in it, etc., etc. But what uh, I did not like was when uh, a post went around, a forward went around, which said that Hindi is the greatest language, and it compared it uh, with English by, <laughs> of all things, giving all the Paryayavati Shabd, all the synonyms for leg or foot, pair, and you know how it's all very rich in Hindi, and then said, oh, in English, there's only leg, which is the ultimate in stupidity. All you have to do is to look up an English thesaurus or anything like that, and you'll find as many references of different kinds and meanings and usages of the word leg or foot. So to take so much pride in your language that you make absurd claims for it is a bit stupid. You can take pride, but be very intelligent at the same time. All right, thank you. One last question. Um, it is by Siddharth. Uh, so uh, when we have, I'm just going to read out what he has typed. When we have uh, children of different personalities and diverse desires for ways of learning, how do we cater to them? And how do we, how do we unify all of uh, those and bring out one interesting approach uh, when we talk about uh, taking a personalized approach? Uh, maybe this is not particular only to social studies, but a lot of any classroom teaching. So maybe if you can just close there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was just going to say, I mean, you, you took the words from my mouth, which is that uh, this is not a problem peculiar to a history classroom. Uh, any group is going to be diverse. Just please take that for granted. Any group, whether you're working in preschool or at any other level of the classroom, whichever subject you're teaching, you could be in college, university, you could be uh, a director working with a group of actors, you could be in a dance class, anything. Every person will be learning at their own pace and every person will have a different personality and skill, uh, skill level. And I think desires, that's the thing you mentioned. So the um, answer to that question and the solution is similar also for everyone. It's a different kind of uh, pedagogical approach that you have to use in which you specifically strategize how to minimize the differences, plus also utilize that in this peer group learning thing that I was talking about. So by minimizing, you, I mean that you have to find out what is in common because enough will be in common in spite of the differences. And the differences can be utilized very constructively by devising ways in which people talk to each other, interview each other, do projects with each other, present with each other, listen to each other, ask questions of each other, right? Whatever you do, do not put it under the rug, as they say, don't hide it, don't try to pretend it doesn't exist. Don't ignore some people because they're too fast or too slow and try to achieve something with the average. Actually, this diversity is very, very rich and it's very productive. It's a difficult challenge for the teacher to be able to strategize with it, but it's a very important and necessary challenge. And if they can do it, very good. Well, I want to thank you so much for attending. Um, let's carry on the conversation, as I always say. I'd be happy to hear from all of you in any form and maybe meet tomorrow for uh, the, a discussion of the teaching of English. Yes. Okay. Thank you so much for joining me today. Sorry for extending by 10 minutes. And uh, you will receive an email uh, in the next week with the recording, the lecture notes. If there were any extra questions, we will also cover those. And keep a lookout for, uh, we have a session tomorrow as well, same time, same link. Uh, it is on the teaching of English. So please join if you're interested. Um, and thank you so much for joining today.